Hello and welcome to Bags of Action. This episode is a break from our usual format. I won't be joined by Steve to dissect an action movie. Instead, I'll be interviewing a very special guest. Joining me on the show today is Taiman Singh, founder of Bristol Bad Film Club, producer of the upcoming documentary In Search of the Last Action Heroes, co-host of the Cosmic Shed podcast, and most importantly for us, author of recent action movie Born to be Bad. Sounds even busier than me. Welcome to the show, Ty. Thanks for having me. No problem at all. So it's great to have you here. So just from mentioning those things that you've done, you obviously have a long history with the action movie genre. So I want to take you right back. Can you remember what the first action movie you remember seeing was? First action movie? Um, I guess it all depends what we mean by action films, because growing up, my parents were fairly laid back in what I watched. Okay. And so I always used to watch James Bond movies with my dad. Um, the Indiana Jones films were a staple, but actually as a kid, I was rather squeamish when it came to violence. I remember, uh, being at my uncle's place and him and my dad were watching Predator and I walked in and I must've been about 10, just as Bill Duke's head explodes. (laughs) I remember just being freaked out by the violence and doing, you know, a 180 turn and just walking out the room going, no, no, that was, that was horrible. I had, a, I, had, I had a similar experience with Alien, actually, uh, uh, probably even younger than that, with the chest-bursting scene. So, yeah, I feel your pain. No, it was, it was weird. I actually remember being even younger and seeing the, um, you know, the Black Knight scene in Monty Python the Holy Grail where they cut off his limbs. <laughs> yeah. It's hilarious now, but to a young kid who had, not, had no idea what Monty Python was or anything, I remember feeling extremely queasy at that scene and asking my aunt if she would go out the room with me so we could play some table football somewhere else and yeah I don't think it was till I was about 12 or 13 I had a friend called Mike who was always ahead of the curve in you know what great films were out there and he introduced me to films like Mad Max 2 and Commando and I think that was when I really kind of just got into action films and and loved them for their you know crazy amount of actions how satirical they could be at times and just how insane some of them were so i i think that's kind of really how i got into action movies yeah so that was was that those are the things that kind of drew you in and, and made it a genre that you're interested in yeah i think it was like you know when you're 12 and 13 you're staying over at your mate's house and you're you're watching films that basically you're far too young to be watching and okay. those were the films i remember watching it was commando it was mad max 2 it was the running man and it, it was those films that kind of created my love for the 80s action genre. But then, you know, as you get older and you explore the genre, you, you find things like, you know, Michael Dudikoff in the American Ninja film. And then you have uncles introducing you to, you know, Bruce Lee films. And then I think it was around 1995 when Rumble in the Bronx was being released into UK theatres. Channel 4 did a whole retrospective on some of the classic uh classic jackie chan films like uh project a and police story and then you in, you uh discover films that way so it it was uh yeah it was everything and anything really great okay yeah it sounds very 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 similar to myself and i'd imagine uh, to steve our co-host as well so so we, uh, one of the reasons i asked you to come on was uh saw you at london film comic con recently uh with your new book uh born to be bad so uh can you tell us a bit about what the book's about yeah so born to be bad came out last year and it's basically me tracking down the actors who play some of the most iconic bad guys from 80s and 90s action films so uh i came up with the idea a couple of years ago when i was watching robocop for the 100th time And it struck me that all the actors playing bad guys are actors that you probably wouldn't have thought to cast as bad guys. People like Ronnie Cox, who was like in Deliverance and Beverly Hills Cop and Kurtwood Smith and Paul McCrane, who was in Fame. And it kind of got me thinking, how the hell did all these actors end up in this film as bad guys? What were their experiences like? Did it change their career for the better being cast as a bad guy or did they ever get typecast in that role so what i decided to do after i kind of came up well after watching robocop was instead of just tracking down the robocop actors i was going to track down every iconic bad guy from my childhood so vernon wells from mad max and commando um 
the terrorists from Die Hard, Bob Wall from Enter the Dragon, any Bond henchmen that I could get hold of. And it just turned into a whole big collection of about 30 interviews of just right. kind of some of the most familiar faces that many of your listeners will be familiar with from people like David Warner, you know, the British thespian who played Sark in Tron and was in Time After Time and Titanic, to people like Al Leon, who played every Asian henchman in every 80s <laughs> action film ever. So it's a, a real diverse mix. Yeah, yeah. And one of my personal favorites who gets mentioned a lot on the show, uh, Sven Oli Thorson, I believe, is the, the, the uh, who opens the book, the first interview. Yeah, he was one of the first interviews that I did, um, simply because he's been in so many action films, often as kind of like a background henchman, but he's worked with everyone. Yeah, he, obviously, he was one of Arnold's closest friends, but he's been in films like Hard Target with Jean-Claude Van Damme on Deadly Ground with Steven Seagal. Um, so I was like, this guy is going to have some fucking crazy stories. And he did <laughs> not disappoint. Um, I kind of put his chapter front and center because I, I personally think it's one of the best interviews in the book. He does not pull any punches about his experiences working with some of the biggest names in action films. He does not filter his experiences at all. And that's another kind of the reason why I did the book, because if you're talking to people like Schwarzenegger or Stallone, you know, they're going to have publicists or, you know, a team that are going to monitoring what they say. Whereas people like Sven, who've just been in every action film, but, you know, they are not A-list stars. They do not remotely give a shit about, you know, yeah, what yeah. they say. And, you know, that's refreshing. No, that, make, that makes sense. Oh, was, one of the things I was going to say, actually, is that, so did someone give you, what was the most, without, you don't have to spoil the actual story, but who gave you kind of the most out there or unbelievable story or the story you hadn't, hadn't heard anything about before? Sven obviously had some crazy stories about his time working with Steven Seagal. So that was great. Um, but it was great to kind of speak to actors like Al Leon and Bill Duke about their experiences, because obviously they are uh, actors of color who mm -hmm. often get stereotyped into various things. So in the 80s, you know, Al, you know, he's a, he's a stuntman, as he would like to say, he's not an actor. So, you know, he, he didn't mind kind of getting typecast in those roles. But Bill Duke has, w was very conscious of the fact that, you know, he's six foot one, 230 pounds. And for young black men to be constantly portrayed as bad guys probably mm -hmm. isn't the best thing. So he made a very conscious choice that he was going to play, you know, police officers or, or army officers, inspirational figures. So that, you know, young black men just weren't seeing themselves as bad guys in films. Well, that's good. And he moved into directing. Is that right? I don't know if he got onto that subject when he was talking to you. I think he, he moved into directing as well at, at one point. Yeah, he directed uh, Sister Act 2, Back in the Habit. Uh, mm -hmm. Not many people will know that. But, yeah, he's a director, <laughs> producer. And the Bill Duke Foundation uh, has been set up to help, uh, you know, black uh, men and women kind of get into filmmaking. Oh, that's great. That's great to hear. I think he's one of those people, a bit like Al Young, that that you just kind of, when you're the right age and you 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 know you see someone in one film and they kind of make a real impression on you just because of their um, their performance and kind of the way they carry themselves. And then suddenly you see them in a second film, and then it's when you notice them maybe on a third film, you go, oh, okay, you know. And you, you know, I certainly got to stage, and I imagine you were the same. You're almost looking out for lower down the cast rather than the main stars as you know as the people that might be part of the draw for some of these movies exactly i mean someone like uh and and alan rickman in you know die hard unfortunately you know alan died before i could interview him for the book but when everyone you know thinks of die hard they think of alan rickman but there are a whole bunch of you know faces behind him that uh have great stories so there was like uh andreas Vinuski who played tony um, Carl's brother who's killed at the beginning of the film and Andreas played uh, the henchman Necros in the Bond film The Living Daylights so he was kind of already established he had already done a Bond film and Die Hard was going to be his next big break but a, you know, apart from appearing in Mission Impossible as Vanessa Redgrave's bodyguard and he also shows up in Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol his career never really took off and then you also have acts like dennis hayden who plays uh 
the terrorist on the front desk. He was in films like Action Jackson and Sniper 2, and he's had a really varied career. But he was faced with the uh, dilemma that many people thought that his character was played by Huey Lewis and not himself. <laughs> okay. You know, that's a whole other challenge where people are like, yeah. oh, I remember that character. That was Huey Lewis. And of course, it was not an IMDb in the yeah, yeah. He couldn't really prove that it was him in that role and not, you know, the guy who sung the power. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, growing up, I think we, we were the, probably the human IMDbs for our friends. Because yeah. they'd be going, well, who's that? What they been in? And we'd be reeling it off. They'd be like, no, they weren't in that. And be, that was the most frustrating thing as a, as like a teenager was friends kind of going, no, I don't think they're in that. And you know, you could swear blind that they were. At least, at least we do know that. But I guess it's a challenge, really, particularly if you're playing more of a kind of henchman role rather than maybe a, a more three dimensional character that, like you say, you could get um, easily typecast into similar roles. You could, or you just disappear into those mm-hmm. roles. So, yeah. Before IMDb, obviously, I watched films like Commando and The Warriors and The Crow. But it wasn't until probably my early 20s that I realized that David Patrick Kelly, Sully in Commando, and he's um, T-Bird in The Crow, and he's Luther in The Warriors, because he's so different in each of those films that you would have no idea unless... You know, there there was an IMDb, or you were very familiar with the work of David yeah, Patrick Kelly, yeah. which you know, as a young twelve or thirteen year old, I wasn't. So yeah, it, it, it's weird that you know when you're talking to these actors, you're just like, oh my god, you're in this as well, and you're in this, and of course you did, you know, Twin Peaks, and yeah, it's crazy. People's careers go off in so many different directions, and no one has the same story. So of, of the interviews that you did, which was the one you were most surprised to, to be able to get? Who was the one you, you maybe weren't expecting to be able to speak to? Uh, Stephen Burkhoff. <laughs> uh, okay, That's, that, 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 I, get, I get that. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, obviously Stephen Burkhoff has a reputation of mm-hmm. being really intense, uh, a bit grumpy, a bit terrifying. And I'd already been told no by his people. And I really felt I needed a couple of, you know, big English thespians in the book. And I kind of kept pushing them until eventually they went, yes, fine. All right. He's agreed. You've got 30 minutes with him. And it was the most terrified I've ever been for an interview. It was one of those moments where it's like, yes, I've got Stephen Burkhoff. And then fuck, I've got. (laughs) Yeah. Am I going to do this? And Luckily for me, he was one of those actors where you just ask him a question and he will just go. But that meant I had to get all my questions into 30 minutes because at the end of that 30 minutes, he went, you know, uh, is that it? Because I've got other things to do now. And I was like, "Uh, yeah, no, that was it. And he just put the phone straight down. So, yeah, everything you've heard about Stephen Burkhoff, I imagine is true. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> so is there anyone that you kind of didn't manage to get or you maybe you can't say or maybe you or you wish would be in there or maybe if you did another book that you might want to do a sequel or I'm actually working on a sequel at the moment oh, okay. so yeah. there were loads of actors i didn't get first time around um when i was writing it i really wanted to interview powers booth and his yeah. people said that yes he would be up for it and then a month later he tragically died ah uh, yeah that that was that was uh, that was heartbreaking. Um, and then you know there were actors who were really busy, uh, such as Robert Patrick, the T one thousand, and Clancy Brown uh, from the Highlander films, and Kirkwood Smith. So I am about halfway through the sequel, and I've done about twelve interviews, and some of those people I've managed to get this time. Um, and you know, obviously, while we were at the London Film TV Comic Con. There were loads of actors there, and I managed to uh, yeah. bump into Jason Isaacs and ask him if I could interview him for it because obviously he started off uh, playing, you know, henchmen in films like Dragonheart, and then he oh, was the main bad guy in Mel Gibson's The Patriot, where he got a lot of flack from British tabloids for daring to play a bad guy in an American film about the <laughs> independence. Mm. Um, so y- y- that man has 
got some crazy stories. And I think because of the Harry Potter films, obviously, yeah, he's familiar to a whole other generation of film goers. But I think those early films, you know, Patriot, Dragonheart, even Event Horizon, where he's not a villain, but that's just a crazy film. I think I'd like to talk to him about those films uh, that maybe he's not asked about. So, so mm. often. That makes sense. I remember um, seeing Lance. I didn't get a chance to speak to Lance Henriksen, but he was at a convention um, a few years back. And I think most people want to speak to him about about Alien. Um yeah. And I was there thinking, I want to talk to him about Hard Target. I want to talk to him about Stone Cold. But thank, unfortunately, I didn't manage to, to speak to him. But maybe, you know, we shall I, see. I think many actors appreciate that. So I, I've already announced it on my social media. But for the new book, I actually managed to get to speak to Robert Patrick, who is obviously the T-1000 in Terminator 2. And he was like, all people want to talk to me about is Terminator 2 and occasionally the X-Files. And I think you kind of really appreciated it that I was kind of, I wanted to talk to him about Double Dragon. I wanted to talk to him about how he ended up in Die Hard 2 as one of uh, William Sadler's and the brothers. I wanted to talk to him about his, you know, director video Wilderness Years, where he was making crappy thrillers like Hong Kong 97 with Ming-Na Wen. And you know, Copland. And I think he really appreciated it because all these actors, you know, we know them for, you know, they're probably their most iconic roles and they probably got the same questions asked them millions and millions of times. But if you go up to someone like Robert Patrick and kind of go, you know, what was it like making Double Dragon with Mark Dacascos and why do you have a bleached, you know, (laughs) haircut? He is like well up for talking about it rather than, Tell the same me. old, yeah, yeah. Two, which he's probably asked countless times a day. Yeah, it was interesting because um, Franco Nero was at the convention we were both at, and um, in his big sign with a list of films, I'm thinking, hang on a sec, the film that one of the seminal films for me, again, that kind of thing, I was at my cousin's house and much too young to see it, which was Enter the Ninja. So I saw Enter the Ninja way before I saw Enter the Dragon, um, but I didn't manage to speak to him either. I'm rubbish at this going up and speaking to people thing. But maybe in the other next show. Yeah, it didn't have any of the canon films that he did because obviously no. he did, you know, Sam Furstenberg's um, Enter the Ninja. And you would have thought of something like the film and TV Comic Con. That is that kind of genre yeah. title that they would push. But, you know, it was kind of Die Hard 2, Django Unchained, and, you know, the. John Wick 2 as well, I think. Yeah. And he's the uh, head of Continental and John Wick 2, which is, you know, great. I mean, and, and like that's done so many. And I did think about talking to him, but I think he's played more heroes than bad guys. I mean, we remember him as General Esperanza in Die Hard 2, but I think that's more the exception than the rule. Okay. So what was the biggest challenge in uh, bringing the book together? Uh, I guess the biggest challenge was just getting people to say yes. Um, Mm -hmm. So many actors, I had a big list. It was just basically persuading them to talk to me Um, who at the time, you know, I'd done some freelance writing for websites like Den of Geek and I'd done some freelance film writing, but, you know, I didn't really have anything big to my name. So it was persuading, you know, these actors to talk to me. And then luckily one of the first people that said yes was Vernon Wells. So then once you have kind of Vernon Wells under your belt, Mm -hmm. you know, you get other people kind of going, oh, it seems legit if he's spoken to, to Vernon, that's fine. But then you have some actors who want paying for interviews, which I wasn't going to do because that kind of sets a precedent. Um, There are some with outrageous demands for getting paid that were just laughable, some of whom haven't been in anything good for over a decade. And you're kind of like, you're taking the piss to a degree. Um, So I think that was a challenge, getting people to say yes and then working around their um schedules because some of them are very busy and still working and just some have other things going on martin cove who's a crease in the karate kid and cobra kai he said yes to the interview six months before we actually did the interview because he was working one of his kids has had a grandkid so he was just all over the place in terms of his commitment so it was just hard to nail him down but you know eventually i managed to do it three days before I had to submit the book to the uh, publishers. Oh, okay. Let's get right at the wire, right at the wire. Right. Yeah. So yeah, we'll, um, 
so just um, obviously there's a documentary you're producing as well. Um, so do you want to tell us a little bit more about that as well? Yeah. So um, Oliver Harper, who some of your listeners might know, um, is a YouTuber that specializes in 80s action films and does these great retrospectives. And when my book came out, he had literally that week just announced the Kickstarter for it. So I kind of got in touch with the team and I was like, look, I see you guys pulling together this film on, well, this documentary on 80s action films. I've literally just written this book where I've interviewed a bunch of actors. So I, I have contacts if you are looking for a research guy. And Oliver and the team kind of brought me on as a full on producer and well, writer to help shape the story. And then I was able to reach out to a lot of the people that I'd previously interviewed, as well as loads of other people that we interviewed for the, um, the film, including Mario Kazar, um, you know, the executive producer and creator of Calco pictures that did the Rambo films in Terminator two and cutthroat Island. Um, Sam Furstenberg of the Canon films, um, Graham Yost, who wrote Speed and Broken Arrow, and uh, Eric Roberts and Philip Ree from the best of the best films. So Oliver did a lot of the interviews in the UK. So he interviewed people like Brad Fidel, who did the Terminator scores, and Peter McDonald. And then I went to LA to interview, you know, everyone else for essentially a, a 10 day period. And so while I was out there, I got to meet up with a bunch of people I'd interviewed with for my book and give them a copy in person. People like Al Leon and Ronnie Cox and Vernon Wells. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it was a crazy week and a half that was just jam packed full of interviews and, you know, very surreal finally meeting all these actors face to face that you've watched all your life and, you know, previously interviewed. And now you can give them a book kind of going, see, I wasn't lying that, you know, I was actually writing a book. (laughs) Nicely done. That's like nice to follow that as well from kind of getting one person to do the book, the domino effect to getting other people and then to the film and meeting people. That's great. Yeah, well done. Yeah. Sounds, uh, sounds yeah. brilliant. Once you have a, a Vernon Wells or a Ronnie Cox on board, then people, it, it gives your project a little bit of credibility. Yeah. That makes sense. So the place that I first became aware of you was actually from Bristol Bad Film Club. So uh, I think we should probably have a little bit of a chat about, about that. Yeah, so the Bristol Bad Film Club I've been running for almost six years now. And this kind of comes from, you know, my love of, let's say, less than great action films. So we're talking about the canon films here, you know, things like Ninja 3, The Domination, which is a crazy film. You know, it's like Flashdance meets The Exorcist meets, you know, Enter the Ninja. It's crazy. Um, For any of your listeners that haven't seen it, basically a gymnastics instructor is possessed by the spirit of a ninja assassin and goes on a killing spree. It's crazy. But it's my, an under, underworked genre, I have to say. It's one of those <laughs> crazy films that you can't believe actually exists. But my dad uh, would always go to the video shop and he would often come back with films of the canon ilk because he would literally judge a film by its cover. So because of that, you would get... Uh, Richard Chamberlain in King Solomon's Minds, because my dad would, you know, through no fault of his own, think it was an Indiana Jones film. That's what these films were made to do. To yeah, yeah. Inspiring it. So I developed a love very early on for the fun, but let's face it, rather crap action film. And my love for B movies, and in many cases, C movies, uh, led me to set up the Bristol Bad Film Club, where once a month, I screen and introduce a film that is so bad it's terrible or has some sort of fascinating story behind it. It's the kind of film that doesn't often get shown and we donate all the money from the evening to a different charity each month. So we've shown films like, of course, The Room and uh, Birdemic Shock and Terror, but also films like Samurai Cop or Miami Connection, which is about a taekwondo rock rock band that fights uh, drug smuggling ninjas and uh ninja 3 the domination has been screened and also paul gasari which is the north korean godzilla ripoff which where the story on how that was made is much more interesting than the film itself because <laughs> Kim jong il kidnapped the south korean director and his wife and held them for seven years and forced 
them to make films for him until they uh, basically defected while on a location shoot in, I think it was the Czech Republic. There's a really good documentary on Netflix called The Lovers and the Despots, which uh, really tells this story, and it's, it's insane. But that is kind of what the Bristol Bad Film Club is all about. We, uh, we show films that, you know, no theatre in its right mind would generally show, you know, films that were often just released on VHS. And we try and put all the money to, you know, a, a worthy cause. That's great. That's great. So yeah, thank you very much for joining me today. And um, so where can people get hold of a copy of Born to be Bad? So Born to be Bad is obviously on all massive corporate conglomerate websites, uh, such as your Amazons. Um, the publisher, Bear Manor Media, they sell it on their website. It's a US publisher, so for your UK listeners, they would probably have to import it. But they also sell a hardcover version, which is rather cool. Um, there is a Kindle version, obviously, on Amazon. Um, but yeah, why not just go to your local bookshop and ask them to order it in? That's what I do. So yeah, it should be readily available. Perfect. And so where can people find you on social media if they want to find out more? So I'm on Twitter as uh, at Timon Singh. Um, I'm also on Twitter as The Bad Film Club, which is the other BBFC. I've got a website uh, which is basically the Bristol Bad Film Club's website. If you either go to bristolbadfilmclub.co.uk or borntobebad.co.uk, it will take you to the same place. So, yeah, that, that's, that's where you can find me. And also there is a Born To Be Bad page on Facebook. Brilliant. One final very important question. Go on. How, how do you pronounce the person who plays Connor McLeod in Highlander? Ah. Oh. So I, th- I always thought it's Christophe Lambert. See, you are officially my favourite guest we've ever had. and Because uh, I'm with you. I'm with you all the way. Yeah, Christopher Lambert or Christophe Lambert. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Ty. Thanks very much for coming on. Okay. So don't forget, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel where you'll find our full episodes and some special five-minute film reviews too. Write us a review on iTunes while it still exists. Follow us on Twitter at Bags of Action and join the Bags of Action Facebook group. Thank you for listening, if indeed you still are. <laughs>